Okay, um, this is Jay Fidel. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Community Matters. It's the movie show, as a matter of fact, at five o'clock on a given Wednesday. We have George Kaysen to help us review another movie. And this movie is a very important movie called Winter on Fire, documentary made of the Maiden uh, Square protests in the Ukrainian revolution of 2013 and 2014. And it is very interesting and totally relevant to what is going on now. George, uh, say hello to the people and tell us about this movie. Hello. You can hear me now, right? Mm -hmm. now, this movie is a documentary about the 2013 to 2014 Maidan uh, uprising uh, of, of the public in Ukraine when there was a thing with the president Yakulovich uh, had promised the public that they were going to join the EU. And then he, because of Putin's pressure, they backed out, right? He, uh, he backed out and then they were, they was, he was going to, they were going to become part of the so former Soviet uh, economic uh, organization. So the public felt, uh, you know, they were cheated. I mean, they, ex they expected to have Ukraine become part of the EU, which would help the economy, help bring up, you know, salaries and whatever. So they re revolted. And, and the way uh, this president reacted with Putin's backing is to bring out the Berkut, which is the military police, uh, initially, rubber bullets, they had, they were shooting rubber bullets at the protesters, right? And then they brought in the, these criminals, uh, something with a T to, you know, uh, other than the Berkut. And then they f infiltrated those, those criminals into the uh, protesters to rile them up, which would give an excuse to, to, for the Berkut to go and be more brutal. And eventually the bullets started being, uh, real, you know, real bullets and shooting people and killing people. And this was all to, to put down this protest, you know, in the most brutal way. And then they, they show all the different stages, you know, uh, in this documentary from, from the beginning and how it got worse and worse and worse. And then all, all blood protesters being shot and beaten and killed and horrible. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the basics of the movie from my perspective. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to add one thought to your rendition, which I thought was a good thumbnail of the movie, is that part of this involved snipers. Now, the Berkut would, would position themselves on the top of buildings um, and, um, you know, uh, architectural features that would look down on the crowd. And they actually had sniper rifles and they would shoot unarmed people in a crowd. It was really disgusting what they did, uh, and all of this was under under the the uh, the control of um, Vladimir Putin. That's what he was doing because uh, Yanukovych, the puppet, was his who belonged to him, um, and did his bidding. And he was trying to control that is Putin was trying to control um, Ukraine through Yanukovych who was a, a spineless puppet just doing what Putin wanted him to do. Um, so, you know, I mean, the thing is, uh, let me take a moment and talk about the production values. Okay? Um, it reminded me of a movie called um, Abacus Federal Savings and Loan, which was the story of a Chinese bank in Chinatown, New York. Uh, that was the only organization sued um, by Cyrus Vance, a recently retired uh, district attorney from Manhattan, only organization sued after the 2008 financial debacle. And, and he sued them, I think he, he sued them criminally um, for really what was a, a ridiculous claim, ridiculous claim. All these Wall Street banks, but virus fans sued these small family bank in Chinatown. They defended themselves. And what they did was they got cameras. And everything that happened, everything that happened in this suit, which ultimately Cyrus fans lost, and the Chinese family that owned the bank won, 
okay? They took pictures, video of everything, and then they made a movie of it. And the movie, which you can find on Netflix now, I think, is called Abacus Federal Savings and Loan, which was the name of the bank. And what was really important here is that they had the cameras, they took it real time, they took it as it happened, and then they made the movie. Well, that's what happened in Winter of Fire. Um, The Ukrainians had the cameras and they took real time pictures in color Real high, high value, high quality pictures of everything that had happened between late November 2013 uh, and late February 2014. All the meetings, all the crowds, all the protests, all the movements, all the police, all the beatings, all the snipers. Uh, it was all there every day. It was this was an every day. Some people stayed there in Maidan Square for all that time. And the people with the cameras, who you never meet, you never see them, they're there with them every single day. All the blood and gore, all the shootings and maimings and beatings, all the ambulances coming, um, all all the incredibly brutal things that Putin did, it's all there. Um, Just like, you know, um, the documentary about uh, Abacus uh, Federal Savings and Loan. So that makes this movie special. And they did it pretty much right after um, the, the, the protests were successful. And uh, Yanukovych left town. Where did he go? He went to Moscow uh, into, the, into the arms of Putin. And, uh, and the Ukrainians reorganized themselves, reorganized the government and, and uh, confirmed their you know, democratic values and their democracy right after he left. It was really heartrending to see all of this in that movie. Um, so I guess, um, you know, this is a special movie because it, it was actually created if, if the, the protests were over, the revolution was successful in late February, early March of 2014, the movie was made and released in, in sometime in early 2015, okay, which is really saying something. This is a, an historic documentary. And so we, we should talk about um, exactly what happened from November on. The crowds filled the square. There were hundreds of thousands of people. It was the biggest protest imaginable. And men, women, children, children were there every day, every night, living in that square. They weren't going to give it up. They weren't going to let go. They weren't going to let Yanukovych uh, control them or Putin control them. And it was was, was a statement uh, of their character and their courage and their loyalty to each other and to Ukraine as a country. This was a defining moment for Ukraine. And you have to watch this movie to understand them and what, what motivates them and how together they are. If you want to understand their courage today because it all kind of began, this kind of courage began in the 2013-2014 Maidan uh, protests and revolution. Yeah. Yep, uh, this is just a repeat performance in some ways of what happened in 2013-2014. It is, and it, it shows you the, the, the violence that Putin lashed out at with them. It shows you the brutality, the murderous brutality it shows you their response and their and their strength. Um, it's it's really interesting to to see it through the lens of what is happening today. And sometimes uh, I tell you my experience with it. Sometimes I forget that the movie is about something that happened well, what uh, s- seven seven years ago. Sure. Um, but you you think well maybe this movie is what's happening today. It could easily be happening today. It could be a picture of what's going on today. Although today it's not just snipers shooting people in a barrel. It's tanks and planes shooting them in a barrel, killing, brutally murdering people, uh, civilians, citizens, unarmed citizens. That's what he was doing then. And, you, you know, I don't think the world really took note then, but it helps us understand what happens now. Wasn't it 2014 that they also went into Crimea and took Crimea? I think it was 2014. Yeah, 
it, it was after it was after the the, the, the revolution in Maidan. Uh, it was after the the the, the protests in in Kiev. Um, and I guess that was his way of um, of uh, recovering. It was his way of um, saving face. It's his way of continuing his uh, his, um, his his crazy, mad, you know, attacks on Ukrainians. Um, so when this was over, he went and did that too. What a guy! He's you know my reaction, and people disagree with me about this, but he's really got it out for the Ukrainians. It's a grudge match. And if you, you know, it's an inescapable possibility when you watch this, this movie, w Winter on Fire, because you, you can see how they were so stalwart, so strong, so committed, so courageous. And he kept on trying to kill them and, and undermine them and, and, and ruin their revolution in every way possible and, and prop up his puppet Yanukovych um, so that... Uh, you understand him better. There's a lot to understand with him. It's not, it's not easy, it's not simple. But what you get is the man likes to murder people. But why now? I mean, that's my question. Why did it take seven years for him to do this? What, you know, ostensibly what's going on with the negotiations between uh, Putin and, and uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, the leadership or the foreign minister or whatever, is that he says that he doesn't want Ukraine to become part of NATO. He wants them to remain independent. And then and then Crimea, that they have to give up Crimea. And then those two breakaway republics, that's pretty much what Putin is saying on his side, right? So the thing is, my question again, why now? Why did it take seven years for this to happen? You know, I mean, uh, was there anything that triggered him, you know, to do this? Ha has Stoltenberg been trying to increase NATO? You know, um, I mean, I know that they include a lot of the Eastern European countries have become part of and the Baltic countries have become, you know, a part of NATO. Right. Um, why now, Jay? What, what triggered it now? What, what caused Putin to do this now? That's well, I don't think it was a single triggering event. Yeah. Um, I think he's been planning for this for a long time and perfecting his power in Russia. You know, uh, a year or two ago, Navalny challenged him and successfully uh, until Putin, you know, poisoned him a couple of times and put him in jail with ridiculous charges where he is now. Um, so, uh, you know, he was perfecting his power, perfecting his power over, you know, the, the government and the, and the, the people who uh, work for him, the, the ministers and whatnot. And there was a meeting not too long ago where you could see that he was he completely overwhelms them and they have no say. They just listen to him or worry about getting poisoned themselves and losing it all. Losing the money, losing you know family, losing their properties, losing their accounts. I mean, he's a very threatening individual, a very dangerous man. Um, so I think he spent uh, the last well from 2014 to uh, 2022 preparing for what he did a few weeks ago. And uh, I think the, uh, the 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 full answer to your question is um, last night. Okay, and this is another great documentary. On PBS, there was a documentary played um, called Putin's Road to War. Okay, this is a, an hour and a half or so. It just, it just played for the first time last night on PBS, I think. Um, and it's actually more than PBS because it's, it's on YouTube. Uh, George, you can go to YouTube right now today and see a movie that premiered only recently and watch the whole thing for free um, on YouTube. And I think that's a real public service. Now, this is a very carefully, you know, Frontline is an excellent documentary filmmaker. And they showed you the whole thing uh, from the time of uh, Modern Square. In fact, we from before that, and how, well, it's actually, it's, it's Putin's whole life, his whole professional life, back to the time when he was um, there in East Germany as part of the KGB, and the wall came down, and, and the formative experiences that he had. 
And then, you know, going forward, you get to understand him. You get to understand some of the, the brutal and murderous and criminal things that he's done over and over again and gotten away with. You know, they say that, if, you know, if you're a psychopath and you get away with something, it emboldens you. And so this movie tracks all the things that he's done. And each one of them, he, he succeeded. He killed a lot of people in his life. It isn't just a poison for Navalny and others. Um, it's this, all these other things where he's bombing and strafing and killing unarmed civilians. That's what he does. OK, and, and, and the whole thing comes together. The movie shows you how these very interesting threads in his life have all pointed to uh, Ukraine now. And I say I think it's it's in ways it's a grudge match out of uh, 2013, 2014. But it's ways in other ways. This is what he's been planning for many years. And and more than that, this is what his life has been about. It's all pointed to what he's doing now. And it's murderous, and it's war criminal, and it's atrocity. That's what he is. That is also the history of Soviet Union. I mean, with Trotsky and Lenin and all these guys, people getting killed. Uh, you know, Stalin his purges of people by the hundreds of by th hundreds of thousands. You know, people disappear. They're sent to Siberia or they disappear off the face of the earth. So there's sort of a, a, a tradition there in Russia for this, and he's following it, you know. But also, if you look at some of the, like, I, I mentioned Georgia, where there's those, that was 2008, the, the uh, two breakaway republics, because Georgia was flirting with the West, you know, with the U.S., and, and he put a stop to that. And also Armenia, when they had that recent war, you know, last year, he he sort of usually they side with Armenia because, you know, that's geopolitics for him. Right. And he pulled off and didn't do anything because he was angry that the people had voted out his stooge, Kocharian uh, or no, Sarkis Sark's kid and put in Pashinian, who is more Western oriented and started to put out feelers to Europe. So he's, he's you know, basically. He's got the power to do what he wants, and, and he's not happy when his stooges are, are put out of office or being threatened. So then he, he, he does what he has to do, you know. So there's a tradition of both of the murdering, that, like you mentioned, and there's also a tradition of him finding other ways, you know, military, you know. I think they went into Georgia in 2008, too, right? Or they were threatening Georgia. So... Well, it was also a provocation. It's the same kind of thing. Um, you know, a, a false flag provocation. The, the, the most interesting one is where he, um, through agents, um, he destroyed a, a school of, of, of young children during uh, school hours. And he killed a lot of young children. I, I, I know just enormous number of young children in an, an elementary school, I think it was. And then he blamed the Chechnyans for that, um, even though it was him. Uh, and then, of course, what you have is him bombing Chechnya and killing a lot of people in Chechnya. So it's, it's always followed the same pattern. It's a false flag, the phony attack, and then turning it around to his benefit. Now, what, what's different about Ukraine is that you, Ukraine, and a lot of uh, writers have said this, comment, commentators have said this, is that it was a miscalculation on his part. He thought he could get away with it again, that same kind of MO. But, but the world got involved. And um, Zelensky, you know, has, 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 has reached the world. He's touched the world. And the Ukrainian people have touched the world. So you have the EU, NATO, and the U.S. all say, wait a minute, this is war crimes, this is atrocities. Um, you can't do that. But the fact is, and you got to look at this, um, this uh, documentary, Putin's Road to War, which is on, you know, YouTube right now. Um, if, you, if you look at that, you realize he's been doing this over and over again. And the West hasn't really paid attention. He got away with it, and it emboldened him every time, but not now. And that's the, that's the miscalculation. He went too far this time. 
And he's using the same techniques to, to try to double down and, you know, and, 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 and win and destroy them. Um, but it's harder this time, and he may lose this time. Where was that school, Jay, uh, that, that he attacked and killed all those children? Was it in Ukraine or in another area? In- in- no, it was not in Ukraine. It was, I think it might have been uh, uh, in one of the stands uh, or, 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 like or, or in, in Georgia. Right. Um, it was very brutal. And, and they go into some detail in this documentary about that because it was so outrageous. First, you kill the children and then you kill the people you blame for killing the children, even though you killed the children. I mean, I, I don't know where you put that on, um, on on the list of evilness, but it's there. So, I mean, if you catch that and you catch this one, um, you begin to get an idea of what we're dealing with here. And, and the reality is that, you know, he's got the Russian government, he's got the Russian press, although it, it seems to be a kind of a fragile control of them right now, uh, and that may not work for him. Um, and he's, he's been, you know, bamboozling everybody with his threats of nuclear war and, and um, chemical weapons and, you know, and um, um, weapons of mass destruction. So what, what, is, what is interesting is that he's setting the agenda. He's setting the agenda for these, quote, peace talks, end quote, which are not real. And he's setting the agenda for, you know, the, the attacks and the, the threats against anyone who would try to stop him, even though this is Ukrainian airspace. This is Ukraine, a sovereign nation. And he, he sort of claims it. <laughs> he just claims it. Don't touch Ukraine. I own Ukraine, even though the Ukrainians really own Ukraine. It's their country. <laughs> so, but this helps you understand when you start making sense of this, you, you realize that he's been doing it. And only now uh, are we catching him. And one of the reasons we're catching him is because of this movie that you and I are reviewing today. It reveals what he was doing and what they were doing and what kind of people they are. I, I like to open another aspect of this, and that's courage. Courage is the ability, the willingness to fight knowing that you may die. And um, that is one interesting aspect of all of this. It was, it was, it, it was in the movie that we are reviewing, you know, um, Winter on Fire. Uh, It is certainly in this uh, um, documentary last night, Putin's Road to War. And I guess what you what you have to conclude is when you want to deal with a monster like this, you have to have the courage to put your life on the line. And the Ukrainians have that. And I think they gained that in the course of this movie that we are looking at. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're they're not going to just buckle down. You know, they want freedom. You know, they want they have an independent country. And he thinks that it's he's still back in the Soviet Union where it's under Russian tutelage. Right. And now he's threatening nuclear war, you know, whether it's an idle threat. But from what you're telling me and, and I, I know that he's a little crazy, you know, he may just do nuclear war. He's backed into a corner, you know. Uh, you know, if he doesn't care about his own people dying, his own soldiers dying, or or civilian deaths in Ukraine or anywhere else, then he may just, I mean, he's got the nuclear warheads to, to threaten, you know, is he going to do it? Is he crazy enough to do that? You tell me, do you think he's crazy enough to do that? Well, he's way crazier now than he was in 2013, 2014. You know, the point of that of that uh, documentary, Winter on Fire, is that the Ukrainians won. Yeah, yeah. They had the revolution. Yanukovych left by helicopter in the middle of the night. And there's actually footage of him leaving. And the whole country was opposed to him. Uh, the whole country was opposed to Putin. This, for them, it is a grudge match, you know? Um, and so, um, you know, what, what we see is um, a guy who lost the last time. Uh, and then on top of that, he says, you know, he believes he lost, that Russia lost its, um, you know, Soviet uh, properties. Um, but in fact, um, he did lose the last time. And this, this movie shows that, you know, the people 
can win. Now he's back and he's a different fellow. He's much more murderous. It's not just snipers shooting people in a crowd. Uh, it's uh, blowing their whole society apart, building by building, destroying their infrastructure intentionally, killing women and children and pregnant women and babies. Uh, extraordinary. It's different. It's not just a revolution in Maiden, Maiden Square. It's, uh, it's, it's genocide. Yeah. He's, he's gone to the next level. You know, um, Georgia, Armenia, you know, Armenia is threatened by Turkey and Azerbaijan. So they're, they sort of buckle under, you know, to his demands. Uh, but I think there was some changes there too, you know, with the, 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 the Putin's allies were thrown out in those two Caucasian nations too. But um, Ukraine is a big country too. It's, it's the largest country other than Russia itself. And so, you know, he's going to, he's trying to make a, a point that he's going to buckle them and, and he's going to control them, you know, so and the people are not willing to just buckle under and, and, and do that. So they've got this fortitude, you know, of will, you know, and they're, they're, they're fighting him, you know, where, um, you know, so we don't know, I don't know where this is going to go. Hopefully, you know, he'll back down, you know, with all these threatens, economic uh, sanctions and stuff. But I, I don't know. Not clear. He hasn't backed down before. Yeah. You know, he's a double down guy, just the way Trump is a double down guy. And um, there is a really unholy relationship between the two of them. It's like they both yeah. read the same playbook. Yeah. Uh, that's what makes Trump so scary in this country. Uh, and I would be, if I was in Ukraine, I'd be terrified that if he, Putin took over Ukraine, oh my goodness gracious. I don't know if you remember, but uh, when this, this invasion first started, one of the big news items that it was that um, Putin had a list. He had a little list. It's out of the Mercado. I have a little list. And he had a list of all the people he was going to, you know, incarcerate, maybe murder, disappear. Um, treated like Navalny or the, all those protesters uh, in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, he has a little list about the people in Ukraine. And he's already, um, you know, kidnapping mayors of cities in Ukraine. So that's, that's pretty terrifying. Uh, and it'll be something like out of the 30s, you know, with the Nazis oh. in, uh, in, in Europe, in Western Europe, where um, they're, 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 they're going to break the society up and, um, and then do terrible things to the people who oppose them. That's what's in the cards here. But I want to I go to one other thing we really should discuss, and it's the power of, I don't want to say social media, only it's more than social media it's the power of 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 documentary films it's the power of video and and it's the power of distributing that video on social media it's, it's a whole new system and and this movie that we're reviewing winter on fire is an example of that it's a good movie it's an honest movie it's a detailed factual statement of what happened uh, clearly, you, you can't say that it was uh, anything less than that, really. Um, it was made by the people. It is a story of the people. And it went on four months. It's, it, it's hard not to believe it, not to be affected by it. And it's out there. It's out there in many ways. And so we are in a time now, George, where political events, political mm, mm, inflections in our world, um, between, uh, between autocrats or by autocrats can be affected by statements of the truth as reflected yeah. in videos just like this one. Exactly, exactly. You can actually see what's actually happened in the Maidan uh, situation and, 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 and get sensitized to all this. And that's what happens when you get sensitized to it. Then politically, we can tell our president and the Congress to try to reel Putin in, you know. I'm really worried. I mean, he's, he's a megalomaniac. He's gone, he's gone crazy, you know. 
And he's, what's he going to, what's going to stop him? He will, you know, he's, he's well, said, arguably a movie like this has an impact on it. Yeah. But let me go further. So, so now we have claims of war crimes. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a case that was opened uh, yesterday or today for war crimes against him and Russia uh, in, in The Hague yes. and the uh, Criminal Court of Justice there. Yeah. And, and what is and by the way, the spearhead is Harold Coe. He's Harold Coe he used to be the dean of the Yale Law School. Uh, Harold Coe is uh, represents Ukraine. OK, and so the question is, if it's war crimes, how do you prove that? Because, you know, lest we forget, you can't do much with war crimes unless you can prove them. <laughs> so <clears throat> we have. We have these videos. We have the one uh, winter on fire. Uh, we have a lot of the material in Putin's road to war that we we saw last night and we can see today on, on YouTube. And, and we have the daily feed um, in video, real time, live from so many places in Ukraine, so many newscasters, some of whom regrettably have been killed. Um, but they are documenting what is happening. This is the new world of real-time video demonstrating what's happening on the ground, including war crimes. Some of the video that you and I have seen on MSNBC and CNN, and even Fox News and BBC, don't forget them. Some of that video, maybe a lot of it actually, is pictures of war crimes. And it's going to find its way into the courts, not only the international courts in The Hague, but the courts that will seize Russian property, the courts that will, you know, double down on the sanctions, the court of public opinion already affected. So it's different now. I think, you know, winter on fire existed in 2015, but it didn't really sink in. It didn't really take root, this movie, this really important movie until now, because it's somehow you know, it's it's doubled down. It's 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 affected by the existence of what we see every day and the shocking you know, events that take place in in Ukraine. We want to know more. We want to know more about that. We want to know more about Ro Putin's road to war. We want to know more about him, about Russia, about the, the propaganda machine. We want to know more about the Internet Research Agency and, and his attempts to change election results in this country, to, um, to use uh, disinformation and misinformation on our public opinion. All these things, it all sort of comes together. He is a man without morality. He's a monster and, and he's doing all this. And somehow all of, the, all of these things are coalescing. But one of the most important things is the movie we're reviewing and other movies and all the TV footage. It's hard to argue. Yeah. It's hard to argue with that TV footage. Now, Putin has said, oh, these, these Americans, they just make this stuff up. This isn't true. This is all fake news. It's all fake video. Give me a break. Nobody is going to believe that. It's no. true. It's full, of, full of garbage. Yeah, that's not true at all. Yeah, he they he played into this whole election thing, too, you know, with the, the, the first election in 2016 with Hillary and Trump. And then and then the second one with uh, Biden and, and he lost this time, you know, uh, Trump lost. So, uh, yeah, so what, what you have, what you have is people in the, the Maidan Square Revolution um, became stronger. And and uh, by virtue of the fact that they succeeded, by virtue of the fact that they stayed there over how many months, you know, 90 days plus. Uh, and then by virtue of the fact that the movie was made and circulated uh, to give them more courage yet. OK, and then you have other movies that were also not that popular between 19, uh, 2015 and now, but have become popular because they show us the trends. They help to put the story together and the TV footage. All of this has to change the way we look at things, has to change the way we see the world, has to change the way autocrats and monsters are, are treated by public opinion, by international organizations and the like.
And it not only emboldens the Ukrainians, it emboldens those who would potentially support the Ukrainians, the EU, the people in all the cities of Europe, including, you know, the, the, Balk not the, the Balkans and the, um, and the cities up, up north. Um, they're all affected. And this is a, um, a you know, a, a pan-European kind of reaction. And to some extent, we'll see how much over the next few weeks, the people in the U.S. who get who get a daily feed of what's going on there. And if they care about humanity, they and then furthermore, you get people who are sending money, sending medical supplies and traveling themselves from the United States and from Western Europe. And they're all motivated, in my view, by the fact that there's these technicolor feeds, these graphic images of people being killed and dying and attacks and buildings destroyed, residential buildings. I mean, this is hard to take. And some people, not everyone, but some people, they react to it by going over there. They want to participate. They want to see if they can stop it. They care desperately. You can see the, the reaction in the, in the um, New York presentation of, of the Ukrainian national anthem. They played it, I, I forget where, at Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center. Um, and people went wild. You could see in Congress uh, when Zelensky spoke, how they stood up and applauded him with standing ovations. It's because, as you said, George, they've been activated. So let me ask you, where does it go from here? Are we going to see more movies like this? Are we going to see more um, of the, what do you want to call the political social effects of those movies? Well, the article you sent me that I read, you know, talking about the bigger picture, right, of where we're going, I think there's going to be more of this because um, the, the public will, with articles like that will start to understand what the bigger picture is between China, Russia, and America. You know, those are the three big players and, 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 and where we're headed, you know, if we don't do something and these autocrats, including Erdogan, who's a lesser level, you know, if they, if they succeed, you know, um, it, I mean, China, Russia, basically, um, where, where will this world go? You know, we've got to stop this autocratic kind of, uh, you know, business to protect ourselves. You know, down the line, China has got billions of numbers of people, right? And, and, and Russia has nuclear weapons. So we've got to, we can't isolate ourselves in today's world from what's going on overseas. You know, we can't be isolationist. Trump tried to be an isolationist. So uh, not going to work. So yeah, definitely there's going to be more of this and rightfully so get the public more engaged into how this is going to impact them over time. It's technology, you know, uh, the internet, social media, that's technology. These little cameras fit in the palm of your hand and take um, big screen pictures, that's technology. It's the ability to distribute them around the world. It's technology. And although autocrats can use technology and they do, you know, by shutting down social media, shutting down the internet uh, and using, you know, surveillance cameras um, and all kinds of database programs to, um, you, you know, to, to uh, attack people and attack societies and communities. Um, that's on the one side. Autocrats can do that. They have the money. They have the, the governmental leverage to do that. On the other hand, these videos like this movie, Winter on Fire, they get out and they affect public opinion. Then at the end of the day, there's a tension, um, a dichotomy between this kind of movie, this kind of content, and the autocratic uh, efforts to stop it and repress. Those are the two things that are, that are fighting for attention and power in our world of big powers. Yeah. And, you know, you don't you don't know, George, which one is going to prevail. I like to think that movies like this will proliferate and they will knock down any autocrat. 
but I can't be sure of that because autocrats have their leverage also. All we can do is, is encourage the people who made this movie, encourage the people at Frontline who made the movie on PBS and everyone else to make sense of it and publicize it and teach us what is really going on in the world and what we need to do to protect ourselves from autocrats and tyranny. So it doesn't get like catching Hungary, Poland, also becoming more autocratic. So if you can't stop it, it's going to it's going to proliferate because then autocrats can think that they they have the power. And yes, public the social media of today can definitely have an impact. Totally, totally have an impact. Which would be this good. So that's why this movie is so important. And George, we ought to you know commit to uh, reviewing and talking about any other movie that comes down the pike uh, that that is um, of the same character, uh, because those movies are the ones that we care about much more than fiction, much more than comedy, um, although comedy plays a role in Zelensky's popularity, um, and much, much more than the standard, you know, violent late night movies that people watch during COVID. This is the kind of movie that educates us about world, uh, world events and inflections. <clears throat> Thank you, George. You want to know that my, I got it. I would give it a 10. Do you give it a 10? I'll give it a 10. If I could give it 11, I would. Will you take an 11? I'll take an 11 or 12. <laughs> it's a good, it's really a good movie, a good documentary. It's, it's the real world. It's real. There's no fakeness here. You see what, what you see is what you get. So I, I liked it. Yep. Big time. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll be back, George. George Kaysen, uh, movie reviewer par excellence. And Thank we'll do this you. again. We'll find more movies to talk about with you. Thank, Thank you so much for watching uh, The Movie Show on Think Tech. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.